right. Hello and welcome uh, to another Sunday morning service here at WMBC. Uh, Man, if you're watching us online on our, our, our live stream, church online platform, uh, that's awesome. Great to see you there. Uh, feel free to take advantage of, of uh, the chat and talk and, and speak with hosts and other people who are there. If you're watching this later on YouTube or, or anywhere else you can find this, we're, we're so glad uh, that you're tuning in and joining us. I've got a few things I want to let us know about uh, before we move on to, uh, to the worship and Terry's message. Uh, the first is that we're starting a new series. It's, it's a series we're calling Only One. Uh, and Terry's going to tell us a little bit about more what that means uh, later on this morning. Uh, I've got a few, uh, we've got, we have quite a few community events coming up. We may not be gathering here uh, in the sanctuary together just yet, but we have quite a few ways of how, uh, opportunities for us to be the church uh, together coming up. The first of those is actually uh, today when this live stream hits. Uh, on Sunday, we're going to be having a picnic lunch on the West Lawn. Uh, so that's going to be at noon. Again, we encourage you to bring your own, it's, it's actually a picnic. You're going to put together some food for you and your family. You're going to bring a blanket or some lawn chairs uh, and you're going to meet us on the West Lawn. We're going to fill that space up first. If more than 100 people go there, we'll spill over to the North Lawn. We don't care. We'll put people anywhere. Uh, So feel free to come at noon. We're going to have people here waiting for you. We're actually going to have some treats uh, for everybody, stuff for the kids. It's going to be an awesome time to, to get together and talk about what this whole experience has been like uh, for all of us. Some of us have, have learned new things through this. Some of us have struggled through it. And so to get together and be able to talk about those experiences and, and just gather together as, as the church again is going to be wonderful. So uh, I hope to see uh, as many of you as, as can show up uh, there later on today. The next thing I want to point out is uh, on July 8th, that's this coming Wednesday, uh, we're going to be having a campfire on the West Lawn for our students. So if you were in junior high or high school uh, this last year, so that even if you've graduated from high school, you're still invited to this. Uh, you can come out and, and uh, hang out with uh, our, our student ministry leaders and each other. Uh, that's from 7 to 10 on July 8th. Eighth. I've heard, I'm not supposed to say anything, but I've heard there are going to be some snacks there. So Carlina might be angry with me for saying that, but hey, she's not here. Um, the next thing I want to point out uh, is, is home church, something we're going to be calling home church church. And that's going to be the, the week of August 4th to 9th. Uh, that's the Tuesday to the Sunday. Uh, and what we're doing is we're going to be having some different kinds of church gatherings. Uh, we're going to be hosting different church gatherings throughout uh, Winkler and the surrounding area between that Tuesday to Sunday. Uh, and we've already got hosts and leaders set up. We're, we're looking for a few more, but uh, people like Conrad and Val Zacharias, uh, Sam and Trish Berg, Ben and Crystal Rempel uh, have already said, Yes, they're going to be hosting groups of people uh, on their property, at their places. And uh, we've had some questions about exactly what this is going to look like. Um, it's, it's not going to look exactly like a typical Sunday morning service. It's going to be more personal. There's going to be more opportunity for conversation. There's going to be food. Uh, so if you've ever thought sitting in a pew, man, I wish I, I could, I'm hungry. I could go for something. This is for you. Uh, really, the way I envision it is... You think about the early church before you had all of the things that a church service or a church gathering was was supposed to look like. They had to figure out what it meant to get together and like, okay, we're going to talk about how Jesus impact, like what did I hear from God? We're going to talk about uh, the things I'm going through. How am I supposed to follow Jesus in that time? Uh, or maybe you'll, you'll sit quietly and listen and you'll just enjoy uh, the experience. Whatever it is, I think this is a really awesome way for us to come together and do church differently and be church differently. So this is, again, it's going to be first week of August, first full week of August after the long weekend. We're going to be having a sign-up online in the next few weeks, uh, and we'll have more information rolling out to you uh, in WMBC News over the next few weeks as well. And speaking of WMBC News, first of all, there's more information on all of the things I just mentioned uh, in WMBC News, so I'd encourage you to sign up for that. It is the 
way that you can stay tuned into WMBC uh, over this span of time where we're just, we're, we're having to find new ways to communicate effectively. Uh, and we've heard from some people who have signed up, but are still not receiving uh, the message every week. And so, uh, first of all, if, if that's you, if you've signed up for WMBC News and you're not getting that email, please let us know. It might be that we've just got the wrong email address on file for you and we have to change that. Uh, the other option is it, it could be getting screened out by your uh, email provider, whatever, whatever email address link thing program that you use. Uh, it may be sending it to your junk mail or your spam folder, so you could check those and see if it's sending it there and then tell it that, hey, I want this in my inbox next week. So uh, if you haven't signed up and you want to know what's going on, do that. If you have signed up and you're not getting it, let's, let's figure that out together. The last thing I want to uh, highlight for us is uh, an anniversary. We've got Ed and Tina Martins. They are celebrating, or rather by the time this video airs, they have celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary on Saturday, July 4th. And that is just an incredible achievement. I've been married for 11 years this coming uh, August. Uh, 55 is amazing. Uh, that's just incredible. So congratulations, Ed and Tina. If you know Ed and Tina, man, give them a call, send them a card, give them a gift, uh, whatever it looks like for you to, to celebrate with them during this time, let's do that. Uh, and let's make a big deal about this because it is a big deal. Uh, all right, let's, we're going to get to some worship right away, but let me, let me uh, pray uh, as, we, as we move forward in this service. God, we thank you so much uh, for for examples like Ed and Tina and just the reminder of, of faithfulness that we can experience here on earth and, and how you have been so faithful to us, your children, your creation, uh, the people that you've made. And even as we go through, we continue to kind of work out of a, a global pandemic and things are still uncertain a little bit. Um, we thank you for your, your graciousness to us and your commitment to, to bringing us joy and helping us grow. And God, for everyone struggling or continuing to struggle through this time, I just pray that you'd bless them. You give them peace. Uh, you give them hope that, that you are still with them and there are opportunities and ways that they can, can come out of this and you will free them from the things that they're facing. And God, as we move forward, I pray that you'd, you'd give us unity as the church. You'd help us focus on who you are and who we are in you and how we can together continue to pursue the mission you gave the church and the vision that you've given to us as WMBC. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. Amen. Lord bless you. They shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you.
rose from their tombs and the angels stood in love for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born and the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of all shall not near shall not fade by his burden in his name and in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me For those of you that are watching live with us on Sunday morning and to those of you that might be checking this out later, uh, it's good to have you tuned in. So we're going to be studying the Bible together this summer and we're going to be looking at four books or letters in the New Testament that we don't normally study or do a deep dive into because they only contain one chapter. So we're going to look at Philemon, 2 John, 3 John, and the letter of Jude. So for the next two weeks, I'm going to guide us through the letter of Philemon. Now, it's powerful in that its theme is forgiveness, and it's unique in that it's Paul's, not only Paul's shortest letter, but Paul's most personal letter. Now, he wrote letters to other individuals like Timothy and Titus, but there he was speaking to their leadership in the church. He was writing to help them become a better leader. Here, Paul's writing uh, to someone personally about a situation in their life. Now, before we start getting into the content of the letter, uh, let me set you let me set the stage. Let me set, give you the context. So Paul, at this time, as he writes a letter, he's in a prison in Rome. Uh, he actually wrote not only Philemon, but also the letter to the Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Together, they're known as the prison epistles. Now, at the same time that Paul is in Rome, in prison, there's a slave named Onesimus who has fled his master from the city of Colossae. He makes his way to the city of Rome, which is the largest city at the time, presumably to kind of hide out, maybe start a new identity. And who is he fleeing from? Well, wait for it. Philemon, the very person who the letter is named after. Now, somehow in Rome, Onesimus meets Paul. And as Paul is apt to do, he shares the gospel, leads Onesimus to Jesus. And Onesimus changes, he transforms, he grows and matures. In fact, he grows so much that he becomes, as Paul mentions in Colossians chapter 4, useful to Paul. And this is a little interesting side note here. Uh, the name Onesimus actually means useful. So there's a sense of irony here. Paul's kind of doing a play on words. Now, to add to the intrigue, by divine coincidence, Paul knows the very owner that Onesimus has run away from Philemon. He's a friend of Philemon. So, what's the purpose of this letter? Well, Paul, while he's in prison, he's going to send two letters to the Colossian church to Colossae. He's going to send two guys. Tychicus, which is one of the greatest names in the New Testament. Uh, with Tychicus, he's going to send this letter to the, the Colossian church, which we know as in the New Testament, the letter of the Colossians. Uh, and Philemon, by the way, is a part of the Colossian church. He's a house church leader. Uh, to Philemon, he gives a letter 
to be delivered by Onesimus, who remember right now, he's run away, but he's now a free person, a free man in Rome. Paul uh, is, is sending this letter with Onesimus and he's doing so, so he's asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus, which we discover kind of later in the book or in the letter that Onesimus has actually stolen some, from something from them before he ran away. So that gives you kind of the context, the purpose of the letter to Philemon. There's one issue that we need to address here. It's kind of the big elephant in the room, uh, and that's slavery. Paul is writing this letter to a slave owner. And Philemon is described as godly and a blessing and encouragement. And he's a house church leader. And Paul's writing to him to, to take his slave back. I mean, it's stuff like this that, must, that drives people crazy when it comes to Christianity. How can you believe in something that kind of seems to advocate slavery? Well, there's two ways that we can deal with this. One is we can just ignore it and keep going. Um, Turns out that I'm preaching next week, so that's not a great option for me. Second option is we can tackle it, right? We can deal with the topic of slavery in the New Testament. Uh, more specifically, what's Paul's take on it? So if you're okay with it, I'm going to take a few minutes here just to address this topic of slavery. Um, and then we'll move on to getting into the letter. All right, so slavery at this time, the kind of the height of the Roman Empire was, was a common, legal, quote unquote, a normal part of society. One third of the population were slaves. We're talking 50 million people here. By the time of the New Testament, uh, slavery had been going on for centuries. Most slaves were kind of born into uh, a slavery at this time. They weren't captured from, from war. Also, by the time of the New Testament, the, the condition and treatment of slaves had dramatically uh, increased and improved. So they were assured of, of food and clothing and shelter. Often slaves could become doctors, teachers, musicians, librarians, accountants. They would receive training and, and resources from their owners to, to pursue. In fact, many slaves, even when offered the chance at freedom, chose to remain slaves because they, they had it better than a lot of free men. Uh, so there was different categories or uh, labels for slaves. Those who chose to remain slaves were known as bond servants or the Greek word doulos. Uh, what they would do is they would take an awl, they would pierce the slave's ear into the doorpost of their owner. And yes, that sounds bizarre to me too. Um, but that forever marked that person as someone who, who chose to remain and, and be bonded with their master. And so when someone saw that pierced ear, they would go, oh, you must have a good master. All right? and, and so when Paul writes in his uh, letter to the Philippian church, he says, Paul, a bond servant of Christ. He, he says he wants, when people see Paul, he wants them to see his master, Jesus. Now, to be clear, all right, I am no way defending slavery, all right? It's also important to note at this time that in, in ancient Rome, slaves were still considered uh, property by their owners. They had no legal right to marry. Uh, essentially, owners had the unlimited power to punish their slaves however they wanted to, to even take their lives. And so given this reality, we begin to ask ourselves, Paul, why didn't you speak out more against slavery and call it wrong? Well, again, I, you know, I've tried to give you some context to just to, to what was happening in that society. It was common. It was legal. It was a uh, normal part of society. Some chose to remain free. Uh, and it was different than the type of slavery that, that we think of uh, when we think of kind of the 16th, 18th century, century African trade slavery. And Paul... Um, there was that kind of slavery in ancient Rome and Paul did speak out against that kind of slavery. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul speaks about slave traders, those who like the African trade slaves, uh, slavery sold and bought people. Paul called those people unlawful, godless, sinful, that, that the kingdom of God is not reserved for such as these. The difficulty for Paul and for us is that he lived in the tension of two kingdoms. So Paul lived in the kingdom of Rome in which slavery was a part of, which some even chose to remain slaves. And he lived for the kingdom of God. 
And Paul sought to uh, bring the Roman kingdom into the kingdom of God by way of the gospel. And he did. Right? As Paul shared the, the life-changing message of Jesus, masters and slaves surrendered their lives to Jesus, answered the call of the heavenly kingdom, and began to change their lives. And this is what Paul wrote to them. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. To the letter to the Corinthian church, he says in chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave of Christ. For God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. And so you begin to get this picture as Paul describes the kingdom of God that there is no place for slavery there, that we are all one in Christ. And for those of you that are frustrated that Paul didn't simply call slavery evil and, and call slave owners to set all their slaves free, I might argue, as we'll see through the letter to Philemon, that what Paul attempted to do was address slavery at a much deeper and transformational level. Paul calls Philemon not just to accept Onesimus back into service, but to now treat Onesimus as a brother in Christ. To quote Marvin Vincent, the principles of the gospel not only curtailed slavery's abuses, but destroyed the thing itself. For slavery could not exist without its abuses. To, to destroy its abuses, which Paul's efforts were about, was to destroy it. And with that, we're going to make our way through the first seven verses in Philemon. And as we do so, what I want you to do is pay attention to how Paul describes Philemon. Because somehow he feels that he can send Onesimus back, the slave that has run away. And because of who Philemon is in Christ, Onesimus is going to be safe. So, first three verses are just kind of Paul's opening words of greeting. This letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother, brother Timothy. Uh, normally, Paul, as he begins his letters, would appeal to his authority as an apostle, right? Normally, it kind of says, Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle for Christ. Note here that he, he's going to ask Philemon to forgive Onesimus, but he doesn't, he doesn't begin with his authority as an apostle. He, he's not going to say, hey, I want you to do this because I'm the one in charge and I'm telling you to do it. Okay, so that's important to note. Verse 2, we get the first, our first sense or taste that, you know, maybe Onesimus is going to be okay. Uh, I'm writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Aphia, that's Philemon's wife, and to our fellow soldier uh, Archippus, that's his son, and to the church that meets in your house. So the letter was written to Philemon personally, but there's also a sense that the whole church would, would get to, to maybe read it. Then we have verse Three, it's a, a common greeting in 13 of Paul's letters. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Uh, in, it's many ways a summary of the gospel. Grace is by the means of which you are saved and peace is the result of the gospel. Through God our Father, uh, through his son Jesus Christ, by the way of grace, we are being made right and at peace with God. And then in verse 4, uh, verses 4 to 7, then Paul lays it out. Philemon, this is who I see you to be in Christ. And he identifies four characteristics. Uh, and WMEC, I would say that these are four guideposts for us that assure us that we are on the path of becoming a forgiving people. So verses 4 and 5, they kind of identify the first two characteristics. Paul writes, I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Uh, so the first characteristic, uh, Philemon's faith in Jesus. And Paul says he, he keeps hearing about it, right? His faith is, is growing and maturing. And then he's hearing about Philemon's love for all of God's people. That word all is an important word there when you consider Onesimus' situation. 
uh, the, the Greek word for love there is agape. It's a, a love that is of will and a choice, not based on feelings or circumstances. Agape love is, is the love that is a fruit of God's spirit. Uh, and then we get into verse 6. Paul moves from a prayer of, of thankfulness, acknowledgement, and then now he moves into his desire, a, a petition. This is what I want to see more of in you, Philemon. Verse 6, and I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things that we have in Christ. So Paul's saying, I see this active generosity from your faith that is grounded in, in not only understanding, but experience. Now that sense of active generosity, that's the Greek word koinia. Uh, it's a word that we often get translated as fellowship. So Paul's saying, man, I see in you this relational generosity. And I'm praying that as you forgive Onesimus, you're going to grow in your, in your connectedness to the church. And, and note that Paul's desire, his petition that Philemon would grow in this generosity, uh, it's, it's not just a head knowledge, but it's a knowledge that's based on experience. You get the hints that that's Paul's saying, hey, forgiveness is not just to be studied, but to be experienced. You know, it's like me coming to your place one morning and say, hey, let's go for a plane ride. And so you hop in the car, we make our way to the Winkler Airport, we pull up next to the airfield, and you go, oh, Terry, I didn't know you're a, a pilot. I'm, I'm not. I mean, I, I watched a few YouTube videos, read some books. I saw that Chris Unruh knew how to fly. I figured I could do it too. Well, at that point, you're not feeling too good, are you? Because you want your pilot to have experience. Learning to a, be a pilot involves getting experience. Learning to forgive involves experience. Until we... Put forgiveness into action. Paul's saying we will never experience all the good things that we have in Christ Jesus. And until we as the church start living out our call to, to forgive and to love all people, the world will never see the full life that we can have in Christ. Because we settled for studying forgiveness and reading about it and not actually living it out in our lives. Philemon if, if you forgive Onesimus, someone undeserving of your grace, Paul's saying you're going to experience good things in Christ Jesus that you have yet to receive. Verse 7, we get the fourth characteristic. Paul writes, your love, Philemon, has given me much joy and comfort, my brother. For your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. Paul gets to speak out of personal experience. You brought joy and love into my life, Philemon. I think we've, we all know people who, um, when we're around, lifts us up, builds us up. And we all know what it's like to be with someone who is a life sucker, right? That drains us, that, that empties us. So based on who Philemon is in Christ. Philemon, I see you someone who... As someone who loves Jesus and is growing in faithfulness. Someone who chooses love. Someone who is relationally generous. One who uh, just brings refreshing kindness. You, you motivate people to be better. Based on this, so I make my request, right? Verse 8. That's why I'm boldly asking a favor of you. And this is where we're going to end. And we're going to pick up the rest of the letter next Sunday. So I want to close with this question for you. And it's a question that I, uh, that I wrestled with myself this week. If someone wanted or wants me to do a good thing, by what basis do they make their appeal? For example, we decorated our yard for Canada today. And, and we did so because we knew we could win a prize. In other words, we didn't do it because Canada is the greatest nation in the world and we should celebrate and honor all the amazing things and people that make this nation great. Now we did it because we, we thought we might be rewarded monetarily. See, Paul makes this request to Philemon to forgive Onesimus on the basis of the gospel. Do this, Philemon, and grace, God's grace will be made more manifest to, to your church and to Onesimus. And, and it's going to give Jesus glory. Do this, Philemon, for Jesus. 
for the sake of the gospel. How often do we make decisions in our lives for the sake of the gospel? You know, a, a few weeks ago, a, a small group of us went to, to pray for Ernie France, to pray for his healing. Uh, Ernie's kidneys have shut down and he's in, in dialysis. And as, as we got to hear, we got to hear their journey and, and we got to hear Mike share with his dad. And we, it was like we intruded on this holy moment. Because Mike's talking to his dad about his willingness to, to give him a kidney. To sacrifice a part of his body so that Ernie could live. And he says, I, I, I want to do this, dad, because, because Jesus sacrificed himself for me. And because he did that, I have the reward of eternal life. I'm, I'm okay. And so I want to, I want to give you a kidney because I love you. And I think it reflects the way of Jesus. And so I come back to that question. Could someone make an appeal to you on the basis of, of you being a conduit of grace? Right, for love's sake that you would say, yes, if that's it, I'll do it. I'll do it for the sake of the gospel. I'll do it for Jesus. This is the kind of church that we want to be at WMEC. Amen? Amen. Let me pray with you. So Father, I just thank you for this letter that we get to read. And the call that you have for us to forgive. And what does it look like to be on that path uh, of being a forgiving person? And Jesus, I pray that as we do life together and we're going to run into situations, Jesus, we're going to call us to forgive even though we don't feel like it, even though it doesn't make sense. And yet there's, there's something there that points to a greater kingdom. Guide us down that path, Jesus. Holy Spirit, oh, empower us, encourage us, help us to be the people that you've created us to be. I'm thankful for the examples and the models that we have to see stories of that um, each month, each week. Thank you for where you're taking us, Jesus. Thank you for, for your love for us. Thank you for Jesus that shows us a better way. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, just a reminder, if you are watching this live at 12 p.m. today, uh, July 5th, we're doing a picnic on the lawn. So we invite you to, to join us there. God bless, guys.